But usually when you see pictures of atoms and their structures, you're seeing pictures of like these little balls and they're shown to be all identically sized, all the same size as each other, but the truth is they're not really all the same size. Some of them are little weeny little teeny things up here, carbon, silicon, magnesium, guinea. Some of them are big coffee things down here. You got chlorine, fluorine, oxygen, sulfur, big, big ones, little ones. And so what can happen, you have these tetrahedra kind of linking up, and there's holes of different sizes of different charges. And so you can substitute one element for another if they are very close to the same size and if they're very close to the same charge. So who looks like they're close to the same size and the same charge? The charges are arranged across here. So these guys are all plus four, a charge. Plus three charge, plus two charge, plus one charge, minus one charge, minus two charge. And then there's no scale. This, this is an example of bad science down here. There's no actual scale on your graph here. But these are little things on this end, and they get bigger in this direction. So it's just showing you relative size is little and big. So would you be able to substitute a silicon for a potassium? No. No, you don't want to do that. You can't stick a great big chubby potassium in a weeny tiny little hole that's meant to hold a silicon. That's one problem. You also can't take something that has a charge of one and put it in a hole that's meant for a charge of four. You can't do it. Nature doesn't like that. You create all kinds of problems with charge imbalance, size imbalance. You distort the lattice. You distort the arrangement of the atom. You're going to destroy the crystal structure. It doesn't happen. But could we, for example, maybe swap out a magnesium and an iron? What do you think about that? Similar size? Sure, they're right next to each other. Similar charge? Sure, they're both on the plus two line. So a hole that can hold a plus two magnesium can also happily hold a plus two iron. It doesn't care. Close enough to the same size, same charge. The mineral's not going to care. Not that it has to be able to care. So look at the graph. Here's a clicker question. True or false? Oxygen can substitute for sodium. Find oxygen. Sodium. What do you think about that? True? False? False is have it. Good job. All right, so we're going to go through the list of the rock-forming silica. These are the common minerals that make up the Earth's crust, the ones we're going to encounter on a regular basis. We have them grouped into different groups. That's a great topic. We have them grouped into different groups. We have dark silicates, which we call ferromagnesian. Ferro stands for iron. Magnesium stands for magnesium, right? So these are things that are rich in iron and magnesium. They're dark in color, they're heavy, and they're dense. Non-ferromagnesium, non-iron magnesium rich. We call these the lighter silica. These are feldspars, musculite, quartz. So these guys over here. Um, and so these, is what you're saying, dark colored, iron magnesium rich, very dense, very high specific gravity light colored, very little iron and magnesium, more calcium, more sodium, more potassium, more aluminum, more of these light elements, and that makes them less dense, lower specific gravity. So the various mineral names will become more familiar. Now, in the 1920s, there was a scientist named N. L. Bowen, I don't remember what his first name was, um, but he did a series of experiments trying to explain some patterns that he saw in nature. So he saw rock outcrops that had the same sequence of minerals, right, from olivine, the pyroxene, the amphibole, biotite, from the calcium feldspar to the sodium feldspar. And he did a series of experiments in a lab trying to understand why minerals grew in this particular sequence. <coughs> and so um, this is Bowen's reaction series. So what he found is, is named after him, like we do with a lot of um, a lot of scientific discoveries. And Bowen's reaction series is basically a model that explains or describes it describes the order in which crystals form if you have a magma that's starting to cool down and crystals are going to grow. So the stuff that's up here, 
Imagine that your magma is all liquid and it's hot and it's starting to cool down and the atoms are starting to arrange themselves into those nice orderly patterns that make up crystals. The atoms are getting arranged. And the first mineral to form is this one called olivine, which is in the picture right there. Now, olivine is a ferromagnesian mineral. It has lots of iron, it has lots of magnesium, and it also has isolated silicate tetrahedra. Just one of them, one of them over here, one of them over here, one of them over here. So it's a very stable structure. Now, as the magma, oops, oh, olivine is a In a way, the clicker question. What did I say? <laughs> Forgot about this one. B, yeah, B is the correct answer. Forgot about that question. All right, now we're moving down one. We move from olivine into pyroxene. Augite is a particular flavor of pyroxene. Pyroxene is a group of minerals. Um, it's like a group of closely related organisms. Wolves and dogs are related to each other, but they're different species. You have these group names of minerals. Um, Pyroxene is a group name. And it forms chains of these little tetrahedra. So instead of having one here, one here, one here, now they're linking up in chains. So our structure is getting slightly more complicated. Pyroxene has slightly less iron and magnesium, slightly more of the lighter elements. As we continue cooling, we move from pyroxenes into amphiboles, and there's a picture for you. And we move from single chains into double chains. So now our little tetrahedra are linked up into these two-sided chains. You have to imagine that these are continuing in three dimensions. Um, cooling, crystallizing, a little bit lighter, a little bit less iron and magnesium. <coughs> and the interesting thing about amphiboles and pyroxenes Augite, again, is a mineral within this group of minerals called pyroxene. The word one is the one within this group called amphibole. Um, the interesting thing about those is that they look a whole heck of a lot of light. They're going to be really hard to tell apart in lab, I guarantee you. They're both very, very, very dark colored. Um, Augite tends to be on the greenish end of things. Hornblende tends to be slightly more brownish. But they're so dark, they basically both look black, unless you get a really good sample. So the way we can tell them apart is that they have different cleavages. So to tell them apart in lab, you're gonna have to look at their cleavage. And their cleavage is reflecting these chains. So what you're looking at here, here's your little silica tetrahedra chain, and it's going back into the screen, and the mineral is breaking along that stack of chains. So here's a stack of chains, stack of chains, stack of chains, upside down stack of chains. So the chains are stacked on top of each other in these kind of interwoven layers. And so you're gonna get 90 degree cleavage in your amphiboles and not 90 degree, 120, 60 degree cleavage in your corn blends, and that'll help you be able to tell them apart. All right, moving slightly further down, Bowen's reaction sphere series. We're moving down here, we're into the biotype. Now we're moving into the sheet silicates. Yet another level of compost, of, of complication. So we take our individual chains, we hook them up into double chains, and now we take those double chains and we hook those up into flat sheets. These look like phyllo dough if you've ever had the, you know, like baklava. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Getting hungry for lunch here. So like layers and layers and layers of thin sheets. So what's interesting about biotite cleavage? Thin sheets, right? So you're cleaving the mineral. Again, its physical properties are related to the organization of the atoms. So it's cleaving along those sheets. So we're moving down to the bottom of Bowen's reaction series here. We've got our feldspars on the other end. So this is called the discontinuous side because we form discrete individual minerals. We're switching from olivines to pyroxenes to amphiboles to micas on this side. The opposite side of Bowen's reaction series is called a continuous series because it's all one mineral, but we have that substitution thing going on. There are little holes in the plagioclase structure. And some of those holes can hold calcium, and some of those holes can hold sodium. And at the high temperature end, we're more likely to get more of the calcium in the structure. At the low temperature end, we get more sodium in the structure, but it's all one mineral. It's all the same mineral. 
And these are three-dimensional networks of tetrahedrons. So this is such a mess here, you can't even see the individual tetrahedron anymore. It just looks like kind of a messy ball of these. So you have to imagine that every tetrahedron, every one of these little four-sided objects is touching another one. And so they're really packed in there close together. Again, we just kind of went through this. In the feldspars, calcium, sodium, potassium. These are the three that are going to be substituting for each other. So that's allowed because they have similar sizes, similar Charge. charges, because that's all the same family. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> I think this is a, all right, we'll skip this one. I think the slide's a repeat. We already did that one. Oh, we already did that one too. <laughs> all right, oh, like my Feldspar, or the clay, is not part of the calcium sodium <coughs>